Good morning and welcome to everyone from joining us across WA for the webinar Safety and Crime Perceptions versus Reality. I would like to acknowledge the Wajak Noongar people as the traditional custodians of the land on which I am hosting this webinar today and pay my respects to the Elders past, present and emerging. Uh, just some quick housekeeping before we get started. Can everyone please ensure their microphones are to mute? And we have also delegated some time at the end for questions. If you do have any questions for Joe, please send them through in the chat tab and we will go through them at the end of the presentation. Also, at the end of the presentation, when the webinar ends, a short survey will appear. Can you please provide your feedback on today's presentation via the survey at the end of this webinar? So a bit about Injury Matters. Injury Matters is a for-purpose, not-for-profit agency supported by our partners, the WA Department of Health and the Road Safety Commission. We strive to lead the way in preventing injuries and supporting recovery in Western Australia. Our aspiration is that all West Australians live life uninterrupted by injury. We do this through the provision of injury prevention programs and services. We achieve our mission through the delivery of three core programs, Stay On Your Feet, Road Trauma Support and No Injury. Road Trauma Support is a statewide service providing free counselling sessions for anyone affected by road trauma, regardless of when the incident occurred or what level involvement the person had. Stay On Your Feet is WA's falls prevention program for older adults living in the community. Stay On Your Feet aims to reduce falls and fall related injuries among older adults living in the community and encourage confidence in independent living. And the third program is No Injury, which aims to enhance the capacity of people and organisations to deliver evidence-informed injury prevention and community safety activities. The Injury Matters can support you through providing training, networks, resources, data, free support and grants. Expressions of interest are now open for the Stay On Your Feet, Move, Improve, Remove grants. These grants will be available in amounts of up to $5,000 and will fund projects running between the 1st of September and the 30th of November this year. More information can be found on the Stay On Your Feet website and I can also email some information to everybody following this webinar. So thank you for dialing in today. Local governments play a pivotal role in building safe communities and preventing injuries in the community. From maintaining local parks and gardens to developing public health plans and alcohol management plans, supporting strategies to reduce crime and providing services for vulnerable people, just to name a few. Local governments already do significant work in the injury prevention space, although this work is not always thought of within this context. This webinar today is hosted by Injury Matters to provide local governments with the opportunity to learn more about the perceptions of crime and how issues of perception relate to the reality of how safe our communities really are. So our guest speaker today is Dr Jo Clare. Jo is an Assistant Professor and Senior Lecturer of Criminology at UWA. Jo has worked in Australia and Canada and is committed to helping applied practice practitioners utilise theory, research and analysis to enhance the understanding of problems they are encountering with a view to developing, implementing and evaluating novel creative intervention strategies. His research focuses on using available data to contribute to solving applied problems. Today we'll be talking to us about sorry, today Joe will be talking to us about what research and data shows shows us and how this can compare to community perceptions of safety and crime. I will now give the presentation over to Joe, who is dialing in from UWA.
Okay, it, can you see it? Um, sorry, I have to. St <clears throat> yes, I can see you. Yes, can everyone see it? Yep. Yep, that's fantastic. Thank you, Joe. Go ahead. Perfect. Okay, thank you so much. You can hear me okay? Yes. Excellent. Okay. Uh, well, thank you for everyone for tuning in. Uh, it's the first time I've done one of these, so uh, bear with me. Hopefully it's it's worth your time. Um, what I wanted to tell you about today is a version of a talk that I gave at a, a conference sort of late last year, uh, middle of last year. So I'm revisiting that presentation really. Uh, I made it at the local government community safety conference in August. And um, the reason I was asked to go along was that the um, local government community safety officers are starting to uh, feel like they're getting an increased number of calls and complaints that relate to locals' perceptions about crime and safety and people's reduced feelings of being safe. And the types of topics that are, are being brought up with local governments include things that some of them aren't really crime in the sense of things like homelessness and um, some are sort of low level annoyances that cause a lot of damage, but uh, things like graffiti, and then there's alcohol consumption, drug consumption. And the question was, how do they have this sort of appearing apparent disconnect between what local government's awareness of crime and crime problems is in those areas and what the community's concerns are and the things that are being raised with the LGAs. And these seem to be from the, the LGAs that I had spoken to, they're causing uh, a big increase in call demand, uh, increase in demand for services from the LGA, also from uh, police. And so what I wanted to do with this talk is present you some information about what's actually going on as far as uh, crime and what we know about frequency and the extent to which crime is a problem now relative to what it was in the past. And then talk to you about the role that the media is playing and particularly probably social media in contributing to the situation that local governments are experiencing. And um, also try and finish the talk by giving you maybe some tools about things that you could do to get involved in the, the discussion locally to try and address people's perceptions of safety, maybe ameliorate their concerns, uh, and also just generally increase awareness about things that you are doing and, and data-driven interventions that you're involved with. So that's the point of today. Um, and because I would classify myself as very much a sort of quantitative criminologist, a lot of the things I'm going to talk to you about are uh, being will be based on previous research findings and I'll try and aggregate a lot of the findings in things like graphs and stuff like that to try and make it useful. And so we're going to talk about data. Why do people feel like crime is going up when it's actually been going down? Uh, what do we know about the influence of media, particularly social media and um, people's sense of fear? Uh, and what we could do to try and maybe influence crime and safety dialogue in your local area. So start off, what do we know about crime? So this graph is from a book by uh, a guy called Stephen Pinker. And the book is called Better Angels of Our Nature. And he's interested in why the world has been getting safer uh, for a really long time. And uh, he's trying to explain that. And uh, it's, a, it's an interesting read, but this graph captures the risk of people being killed. Uh, so homicides per 100,000 people per year using best available data. And it goes back to around the 1200s and um, finishes around the 2000s. And what's important about this graph is that the, it's a log scale. So what that means is the distance between a rate of 0.1 and one per 100,000 is the same on the graph as between one and 10 and 10 and 100. So if the graph was drawn to scale, it would disappear uh, up in, off the top of the screen and it wouldn't be very helpful. But the point here is that you know, by a magnitude of a factor of sort of 10, uh, the risk dropped from, say, the 1300s, 1500s into the 1600s. So it went from being between 10 to 100 uh, per 100,000 people were being killed down to between 1 and 10. Uh, and that sort of rate persisted until around the sort of 1900s and we've sort of stabilised across all these different parts of the world where now the homicide risk is around 1 per 100,000 people per year in, uh, across all these different parts of the world. So 
definitely the rate of, at which people are being murdered has declined massively and it's been going down for a really long time. Now, this is important in the sense of putting recent crime declines, which is what this next graph shows us. Um, and this has been the work of a guy called Graham Farrell and colleagues, and Graham is based in the UK. And he's been writing for about the last 10 years or so about this phenomena that he's calling the global crime drop. And you can see this is data from the US and around 1990 when uh, vehicle theft peaked as the top sort of orange line and violence around peaked maybe about 1994, you can see there's been a steady decline of those two crimes which very closely overlap uh, looking at comparing to 1976. Uh, and you can see that there's also from 1970, say 1980 onwards, there'd been a relatively steady decline of theft and burglary in the US. So for a long, long time now, uh, a lot of these crimes in, in North America have been going down. This isn't just a North American effect, this is data from the UK. Similar time period, not quite the same, but mid 90s, uh, the British Crime Survey has so, shown a sharp and steady decline in victimisation in, in the UK. Uh, you can see there's a blip according to counting rules uh, and how police measured things that they were writing down in their data sets, which influences the extent to which they were uh, measuring crime in different ways. But you can again see from even from after the change in rules from around 2002, 2003, there's been a steady decline in police uh, recorded crime in the UK as well. This is Australian data. Uh, this is Australian Bureau of Statistics um, victim survey data looking at household crimes. So we can see all of these different crime types, break in, break in attempted to break in, motor vehicle theft, theft from cars, other theft, up to 2016, all these things have declined relative to the starting point, uh, 2008, 2009. Same for personal crime that we looked at here, physical assault, threats, robbery, there's been reductions according to victim surveys. Uh, uh, over the same period of time, we can see steady declines. If we look at what police recorded crime data shows us in Western Australia between 1999, 2000 and 2017, 18, we can see that over that time, there was a 38% increase in Western Australia's population. But uh, when we convert this to a rate, we can see that there was a 56% reduction in burglary, 22% reduction in non assaults, 62% uh, reduction in motor vehicle theft, 57% reduction in robbery. So steady uh, and consistent large declines in, in victimisation and police recorded crime in Western Australia as well. <clears throat> Importantly also, kids are better behaved and this is not just an Australian uh, phenomenon we're seeing this. This graph shows from the UK, USA, New Zealand, Canada, Germany, and something important happened around 2007, and this is not well understood exactly what's going on, but in these countries what's happened is that there's been a year-on-year -year decline, steady decline, in the extent to which uh, juveniles are offending uh, in, in these different areas. And that's really important from a developmental criminology perspective because we know that the more you can keep young people out of uh, an offending sort of situation early in their lives, the less likely they are to go on to become adult offenders as well. And so the flow through of this is, is going to have an effect on prison populations in all of these countries. The Australian Bureau of Statistics released this, uh, sorry, the Australian Institute of Criminology released this paper last year, uh, titled Where Have All the Young Offenders Gone? Uh, and they're just comparing two different birth cohorts and trying to make sense of what's going on. Uh, how can we explain this large and, and sustained reduction in offending for these young people? So um, we also know that crime is happens in non-random ways. So the crime that is continuing to happen uh, doesn't happen to everybody. It happens to a very specific subset of, of people in society. And this is important when we're trying to make sense of risk. So. We know from victim surveys that only about 2.4% of the population will experience an assault in a 12 month period, 26 will experience some sort of threat of an assault in a 12 month period. Now, if we look at the frequencies at which this occurs, so you know, for assaults, that means that 97.6% of the population didn't report any assault in a 12 month period. Now, this graph shows us that if you did experience at least one assault, 11% of that sample so 11% of the R2.4%, they experience six or more incidents in a 12 month period of assault. So now we're getting a picture that says 
Crime's been going down for a long time. It seems to be going down everywhere. Kids are offending less. Most of us aren't victims of assault in a 12 month period, but if you are, then repeat victimization is a really big problem. We see the same pattern if we look at household crimes. So 97.8% of all households don't experience a break-in in a 12 month period. 99.5% of households don't experience theft of a car. But we see again, if you do experience one of these things, 9% of households that did experience one break-in experienced three or more break-ins in a year. Uh, if you experience theft from your car, you experience 4% experienced three or more incidents of that happening over a 12 month period. So there's this reduction overall and a non-random repeat victimization for a certain section of the community. Now this graph shows us the outcomes of a meta-analysis done by John Eck and some of his PhD students uh, in the US. And each one of those black dots and uh, sort of gray squares represents the findings from a different research study that was done independent of each other. And what they've done is aggregate all of the findings to try and look at the extent to which crime occurs to victims and how concentrated is this. And what they found importantly was that 10% of the population experienced nearly three quarters of all of the victimization that occurs. So that means 90% of the rest of us only experience 26% of what's going on. And that the most victimized 10% of the population experienced over one third of all of the victimization that was going on. Now, why does that matter? Well, it shows that crime is not random in the sense of who it's happening to. And it's also really important if you think about how could we do things to try and drive down crime, knowing these patterns would say, well, I don't have to fix it everywhere, but imagine if I could stop that 10%, the most victimized people being victims of crime moving forwards, I could reduce all victimization by 35%. That would be amazing. I really targeted use of uh, resources in that sense. We also know that crime happens at non-random places. So it happens not randomly to different victims, it happens in particular spaces in a non-random way. So this study, again, done by John Egg, looked at the extent to which police calls for service were clustered within a different city area. And he found that as you got increasingly smaller geographic units, then you were accounting for increasingly larger percentage of crime with a very small number of those units. To the extent that down to a particular address, he found that 10% of actual specific street addresses in a city accounted for 80% of all of the crime the police were responding to. So that means there's this incredibly small clustering geographically of the demand for service as far as police were concerned. We also know that crime happens at non-random times. So this article came out around the time of the World Cup last year uh, and the headline says, as England prepare for semi-final, uh, domestic violence services prepare for a long night. And what the article went on to talk about was that data from police data has shown that um, domestic violence increases by 26% when England play, there's a 38% increase when England lose, and there's a 41% increase uh, more locally looking at state of origin in New South Wales uh, on state of origin day. So there's this link between whatever's going on as far as this sporting event is concerned, whatever other behaviours uh, go along with that potentially increased alcohol consumption, testosterone, whatever your explanation might be, and the likelihood of domestic violence victimisation. <laughs> we did some work uh, for West Australian Police about 10 years ago now, showing that um, if you compare all of the days of the year, the frequency at which police officers were assaulted, then Australia Day was run away the highest day in the year, followed by New Year's Eve. And these are non-random in the sense of the types of behaviours that individuals might be engaging in that would mean they'd be making bad decisions that might influence the likelihood of them punching a police officer. So we've got this position where we now know that crime has been going down a really long time. It's been going down everywhere that we've got good data uh, to tell this story. Uh, it's going down for young people. We're also in a position where um, there are, we now know, and we have known this probably for about 40 years, that there's a very small section of the community who experience a large percentage of whatever crime is occurring from a victimization perspective. And that there's a very small number of physical spaces that um, where a large percentage, a disproportionately large percentage of crime occurs. So these things are true. Uh, now, in parallel to that, we have this situation where people generally 
feel like crime is increasing. So there's something going on around fear. And so the next section is going to try and make sense of that. Some news articles here to give, demonstrate again more recent type feelings uh, leading up to the, the state election in Victoria last year. The, um, the then opposition, who are still the opposition, ran a very sort of fear driven, tough on crime campaign. Uh, and this study came out to say that Victorians were more worried about crime than their commute times, uh, regardless of the fact that commute times are going up and have been for a long time. Uh, congestion around Melbourne is a real problem, and crime has been going down and has been for a long time. And uh, when it does happen, it happens in non random ways to non random people at non random spaces. This story from Perth Now Safety in Perth, women and men reveal they feel unsafe in the city at night. So this sense of fear, even though we're in a position where the likelihood of uh, crime has been decreasing, uh, and particularly even in um, areas like Northbridge, where there might be a lot of uh, potential uh, for crime at night, it still is non-randomly distributed across space. There are some places that are, you are much more likely to be a victim of something than if you're generally in Northbridge uh, in other areas. Now these feelings, this disconnect between the reality of crime as far as measurement is concerned and people's feeling of fear and their sense of risk, um, this is a pattern that we've seen in, in other parts of the world as well. So despite those declines, this graph here shows that the bottom line shows that people have an awareness that you know crime is going down in their local area, but nationally they felt like crime is going up and this divide between around 2002, 2003 and this steady belief that, well, it, it might be getting better where I live, but generally things are definitely getting worse. Same sort of pattern when we see uh, violent victimisation, the light green line at the bottom showing this sort of steady decline in a different way, the same data that I would have showed you earlier on in a different graph. Um, but people's perceptions that crime was going up, again, from around the same time, 2001, relatively steady, uh, increase in people's perception that crime must be increasing, even though victimisation was going down. So why does this happen? Well, there's definitely some reasons about this, right? So there's some things that are important to understand as well from data. So we know that even though crime overall has reduced, there are some specific types of police activity that say those particular types of crime are going up. Uh, and this graph represents uh, investigations uh, that were finalised or not finalised and frequencies of sexual assaults. Um, and you can see that from around, you know, there's a relatively sort of steady uh, percentage increase year on year as far as investigations not finalised. Uh, and you can see the line, the dark line at the top showing that the frequency of sexual assaults um, started to increase around 2011, 2012 and steady increasing to 2014. Now, this is why it's important when we're talking about crime trends to be able to triangulate um, different sets of data because they give different insight into what's going on. And victim surveys are really useful because they give an insight into how much of something might be happening in the community, regardless of whether people report it to police or not. And police recorded crime is important because it, sometimes it shows an increase in police recorded crime could mean that there's more crime happening or it could just mean more people are talking to the police about things that have happened to them. And so there has been an increase recently in um, sexual assaults that are recorded by police, but uh, I think the reason for that connects back to the, the positive change in attitudes about the fact that it's not okay and that things, even historical sexual assaults are now being brought to the police and they're dealing with that. We see a similar sort of pattern relating to um, changing likelihood of people reporting things, domestic violence related uh, reports to police. And again, I think this connects to the positive public attitudes and the changes that have taken place over recent years, including uh, Rosie Batting being named Australian of the Year. And so this, this table shows that percentage changes in domestic assaults, threatening behaviour, deprivation of liberty, breach of restraint order from 2013-14 up to 2015-16. And you can see large percentage increases in the reporting of all of these particular types of offences uh, to, to police. But victim surveys over the same period of time show that uh, victimisation is sort of stable for violence or maybe slightly declining. So we're in a position where it's the increase is because people are talking about this more rather than it's happening more. And talking about it more might be part of what's contributing to making people feel like there's more of this happening. 
Despite that sort of high level global crime drop that Farrell and his colleagues have written about, we also know that there are some local areas where very specific types of crime has increased vehicle crime, for example, in this particular site. So it isn't the case that at a very local geographic level, crime has uniformly dropped everywhere. We still do get some areas where crime is increasing. And we also get high crime areas relatively. So this graph from Victoria, the darker end showing uh, frequency of um, sort of criminal incidents. You can see that there are some areas relative to others that have much greater frequency relative to the population. Um, this is a graph from New South Wales, a map showing similar things, that they still, despite the fact that crime has been going down for a long time, we still do get some areas where there is an increase uh, and relatively higher rates of these particular types of offending. And I would show you Western Australian data, but we don't have any available because we don't have an equivalent crime statistics body to what they have in Victoria and New South Wales. So the best I can do is to show you that these types of patterns exist, and I know they would exist uh, in Western Australia if the data was, was made public and available in that sense. We also know that crime's going down, but we still do get chronic repeat offenders. So this graph shows trends in uh, frequency at which uh, offender rate uh, of the population over time from 2008-9 up to 2016-17 in Western Australia. So we still, it's declined slightly, but we still do still get uh, relatively you know, consistent frequency of offenders as a, a small group of the population. But we do importantly still get chronic repeat offenders. So this is another meta-analysis done by John Eck and his PhD students, the same group. And what they're interested here now is looking at what they call uh, ravenous wolves, the extent to which a small group of offenders commit a large amount of crime that's going on. And they, the, the studies that they aggregate here show that 10% of the population accounts for two thirds of all of the crime, as far as perpetrators are concerned, and within that offending population, the most active 10% of offenders, they commit over 40% of all of the crimes that occur. So a very small group of people within the community are the ones who are uh, committing a big, large bulk of the offending behaviour that's going on. So we still do get these chronic repeat offenders. Other reasons why people might be feeling like crime is getting worse when the data shows that it isn't, is that it's not always obvious the influence of things like population growth on outcomes as far as crime measurement is concerned. This sounds like I'm getting into technicality, but it's really important. And I'll give you an example why. So crime rates control for, the denominator in the rate controls for the changing in the number of potential targets for a particular crime. And it helps us standardise across time periods so that we can compare better to make sense of what's really going on. So this story from a couple of years ago in the West Australian talked about how burglaries, home burglaries had hit a 13 year high. And then they give some absolute numbers in the sense of 2,790 homes targeted in you know, the, the previous month, up from 2,700 the previous January, so a year on year comparison. Um, and then they compare it back to January 2004 when this certain amount of homes had been burgled in that particular month back then. So using a story that uses month on month comparisons and absolute numbers of burglaries that occurred and painting this picture that crime had hit this uh, 13 year high, this particular crime type. Now, what this story didn't account for is the population had changed massively from 2004 up to 2017 in Western Australia. Uh, and so that there'd been roughly a 37% increase in the number of houses in Western Australia over that period of time. So if you're talking about burglary, what that means is that the potential population of targets, assuming all houses are equally likely to be broken into, had increased by 37%. And so if you converted this to a rate, the year, you know, the, the month rate divided at, over those two periods of time, you can see that there was actually a 33% reduction in the rate of burglary per 1,000 houses from 2004 to 2017. And that wasn't the story that came across. So the media was telling us a story that was different from what a correct analysis and presentation of the data would have shown. And this sense of crime rates is important. A colleague of mine from the US writes stuff about this saying that he just wishes, you know, one of the stories he's written recently saying, I just wish police would stop making these year-to-date comparisons 
they're not helpful. Uh, this small number variation masks uh, meaningful change uh, and it makes it difficult to, to communicate what the truth is about what's going on as far as crime is concerned. So this example again shows that if we just count absolute numbers of data uh, from a police perspective, you can see that relative to 2009, it looks like there's been a steady increase in the number of offences uh, that police were dealing with. So it makes it look like crime is worse. It makes it look like it's different from uh, the things that I've been telling you so far. But if you convert it back to crime rates in the sense of per 100,000 people, keeping in mind that the population has increased steadily in Western Australia for over that period of time, you can see we get declines in all crime, declines in household crime, declines in uh, crimes against the person, excluding domestic violence and sexual assault, and large increases in domestic violence and sexual assault, which tap back into the Royal Commission effect, the Rosie Batty effect that I talked about earlier. So I think incorrect representation uh, of information around crime is part of the story. Uh, failure to analyse these sort of trends and, and put them in context effectively as part of what's going on. But I think on top of that, there's also the influence of the media. So in the next section, I'm going to talk to you about the role that the media plays in people's perceptions that crime is worse and increasing people's sense of fear. So if we look first at more, what do we know about traditional media, traditional media sources? There's definitely been this complicated um, network nexus in between these main players that influences uh, what the media report about, what politicians talk about, uh, what public opinion is about particular frequencies of things, what we should do to respond to things. And then there's also special interest groups who have uh, usually sort of a limited number of agenda items that they're particularly focused on. And there's a discourse that goes on between these key players and they influence each other. This isn't a linear relationship, but it influences what gets talked about at any particular time in this sort of dynamic context. Now, the media has some choices about how they can choose to present information about things like crime. They could base their reporting largely on facts, try and avoid emotive presentation styles, give balanced perspectives, or at the other extreme, they could focus on sensationalism, emphasising particularly graphic, unusual uh, crime types, report things out of the official context, try and sell a story, a particular message, push an agenda. Now, the problem here from a, a traditional media sense is that sensationalism is definitely more popular, it's more available, and it's much more digestible. Uh, we know that news uh, items, you know, this the idea that if it bleeds, it leads. Um, news uh, agencies will look for things that they think are newsworthy, titillate patrons, emphasise things that are shocking, tell things in deliberately simple ways, uh, and present this sort of binaries between good and evil, us versus them. And if they get anything wrong factually, then they'll just retract it a few days later in a way that nobody really pays any attention to. And this quote, which is relatively old now, talks uh, captures what is still true, I think, about the media. So in reporting crime or violence in a sensational way, the media may well be giving sections of the public the sort of food that they want, but their appetite grows with the eating. So from recent research, these are some examples uh, that I put together just before I gave the talk last year. So this uh, headline of the article, a black teen, a white cop in a city in turmoil, analysing newspaper reports on Ferguson, Missouri and the death of Michael Brown. So this is a, an example where a police officer shot uh, an African-American man and then there was a riot in the town and the shooting was deemed to be unlawful uh, through the court of law. But the media had presented this information where when they analysed the stories that were presenting information about what had happened, they rationalised the officer's behaviour as self-defence in a large percentage of the articles. Uh, they repudiated information in the sense that they were drawing attention away from the fact that Brown was unarmed, out of reach of the officer when he was shot. So they were still trying to excuse what had happened in this particular example in a, a very sort of much more sinister way, if you think about the, the reason why they might be doing that. Extra, extra, the importance of victim-offender relationship in homicide newsworthiness. So this uh, paper looks at nearly 4,000 news stories for, from Canada and tried to see how they made a presentation of homicide in the print media 
and what they did with respect to the uh, information that they presented about the case and with respect to the victim offender relationships. So even though women are much more likely to be victims of homicide by their partner than usually in their homes or somewhere in private like that, domestic homicides in this sample were reported less prominently, they were given less words in the story, they were less likely to be on the front page, they were less likely to include images. So we don't focus on the thing that's the most frequent, most likely uh, from a risk perspective, we focus on the thing that is more sensational in the way that we present this in the media. Mental illness, the media, moral politics of mass violence and the role of race in mass shooting coverage. So again, this analyzes a, a range of stories from the US, uh, mass shooting related articles and found particular aspects of offenders were presented in different ways with respect to mental illness, depending on uh, their, their ethnicity. So white or Latino offenders were more likely to have their criminal behavior attributed to mental illness. Black offenders were more likely to be presenting the story as if it was something innate and inherent about African-Americans. Um, the rhetoric went along with pushing the agenda in these particular uh, stories that were analysed for this study. So you can see we get the presentation here. This is the way uh, that the media can do things to try and influence the extent to which they sell a story. Uh, and then on top of that, we also are influenced by totally fake news. Um, so um, this article deconstructed around the time that Trump was trying to ban seven nations, travel ban, particularly Muslims from those nations from coming into America. And the story presented by saying that in the 40 years up between 75 and 2015, terrorists born in the seven nations that Trump was trying to ban travel from had killed exactly zero people in America. But over the same period, guns had killed 1.34 million Americans and nobody was doing anything about uh, petitioning gun law reform and, and dealing with the power that the NRA has over there. Um, he also, the, the, another news story that again dealt with things that Trump was talking about, about crime by migrants and critique the extent to which this is true or not. And the study showed that uh, there is criminal behaviour from first generation migrants in the US at a rate of about 17% committed a crime in the first year. Uh, but this is actually lower than the rest of the population in this sample, where 25% of the population who weren't new migrants had committed a crime over the same period of time. So these things matter. They're sort of non-trivial and they're significant because they influence people's fear of crime. So fear of victimization is not innate. It's not related to the risk of victimization we've talked about before. It's actually a social or cultural process. Sorry, that's my phone. Um, it's context specific, it's influenced by whatever the dominant social, political, economic, cultural, religious beliefs are that you have at the time. It varies as a function of age, uh, gender, race, income, geography. And so we're in this position where we know that people's engagement with media influences their sense of fear. It's not connected to data. Uh, and what this does is it increases public anxiety and it can then influence people's likelihood of contacting agencies, reporting things, increasing demand for things, living in a more fearful way within their environment. So all of these things matter from that perspective. Now this is traditional media. What do we know more when we look at social media? And this is getting back to uh, the original question that I was asked to talk about with respect to why potentially locally run social media groups were maybe influencing people's sense of fear and safety in their community. And then the flow on effect that they had for demand from local government agencies and police in those particular areas. So it's a relatively emerging area of research. Um, I've tried to track down what we know and I'm, I'm interested in collecting more information about this as we go forward. Uh, but police, as this pop-up suggests, is, uh, are moving in some areas to trying to use uh, Facebook, Twitter, social media sources to try and manage people's even reporting crime to them. Uh, so this is definitely a space that people are trying to engage with and make sense of. So the question is, is this making people's sense of fear better or worse or having no influence at all? So what do we know? Well, we know that Facebook social media consumption um, analysed in the, in the US, um, looking at university students, we know that the extent to which you consume media and the types of media that you consume 
uh, influences people's sense of what we should be doing in response to uh, sentencing, crime violence, uh, their, their fear about what's going on in these particular spaces. So we know that um, your increase in punitive attitudes in the sense of what you, like a tougher on crime agenda, are influenced by the extent to which people generally consume media in the US, national TV news, crime TV shows. Social media consumption also influences people's likelihood of having a punitive attitude um, particularly with respect to sentencing and punishment. And this is really important if you've ever read any of people's responses on things like uh, the police Facebook Crime Stopper page, or if you're enrolled in any of those local government uh, groups, you can see that people typically will report things and then quite quickly we get to a very punitive uh, dialogue in those spaces where people are saying what they think should happen in response to these particular types of offending. Um, and we also know that people's punitive attitudes from this survey were increased or related to being white, being young, uh, having a high fear of crime anyway, and coming from what's important here is relatively low problem neighbourhoods. So these aren't people who are highly victimised, these are people who are from areas where there aren't a lot of crimes. And there was also a link in uh, this study with respect to conservative political uh, attitudes. So Facebook seems to have a, an effect. This Netherlands-based study uh, talked about the influence of WhatsApp, so locally hosted WhatsApp groups, chat groups, uh, spreading information about what's going on, citizen moderated, and they were interested in the extent to which this was influencing things like people's likelihood of reporting to police and their sense of fear. What they found from this study was some positive outcomes of involvement in these groups. Um, Group participation was increasing awareness to public safety issues. The police were actively engaged with the groups and were responding in a timely manner, but they raised some cautions. Um, so there was a low threshold or a lot of variation with respect to what people were uh, motivated to define as suspicious or criminal and the extent to which they might report things. It was almost like an echo chamber effect where people would report things because the group had said you should report this where if it had been an individual choice, they might not have. Um, there was a lot of noise on the groups themselves, complexity around moderating who's in charge, what the rules are, what people post around privacy um, and the risk of people crossing into uh, vigilante type behaviour. And from a sense of fear, there was also uh, this dual effect in the sense that participation could enhance people's feelings of safety, but for a small subgroup, and particularly the, the high users within this group, it actually made them feel less safe. Um, so being involved in these type of locally run, locally hosted, locally focused crime and safety groups was actually potentially decreasing the feelings of safety for the people who signed up for them, which potentially self-selected anyway, because they were already feeling unsafe. So, we also know that there's a link when we look at Twitter, Twitter use and crime and disorder. This is from the UK, a London based study. So it was found again, Twitter postings about disorder and crime were significantly correlated with crime in those areas. Um, but the important take home from this also related back to this low crime area uh, were the ones who were most likely to be sensitive to signs of sort of neighbourhood degeneration. So, if you're from an area, almost like the not in my backyard effect, I think, in, you know, from an area where um, you're hoping to um, keep things nice, then that might be a way that you start engaging at a much lower level threshold about things that you think are signs of problems that aren't necessarily crimes, but they're things that you just think somebody should do something about. And I thought this um, picture captured that nicely. Uh, this is from March 2018. Mosman Park Council encourages residents to report antisocial behaviour and crime in a particular problem street. So there's now an increase, uh, a call for increased calls for service and reporting about very specific uh, thing, not all of which is crime, some of which might be more antisocial behaviour, just stuff people don't want. And we also know from Facebook that there's this naming and shaming phenomenon where people actually are likely to post things, uh, forward things online, share information about stuff when we haven't met the threshold as far as proof or a conviction from a court uh, or anything like that. So we, we're lowering um, the bar as far as the likelihood of engaging this. We name suspects. Uh, we, we potentially increase noise and uncertainty around 
uh, what's really going on by posting information that's not fact-checked and not necessarily true, but it gains momentum out in a Facebook space really quickly. I'm conscious of time, so I'll keep on moving. Um, so how can we influence the crime and safety dialogue? How can local governments do anything to try and improve this situation? Well, as I said at the conference last year, I don't have the perfect answer, so I'm sorry if you've been waiting for that one. Um, but I could propose some ideas about how LGAs and other agencies in this space could engage with local crime and safety dialogue to try and maximise benefits and minimise any sort of negative consequences. Um, I'm not clear about the content of all of the social media groups, and I'm not clear about how much is accurate of the information that's on there, how much is fear driven, how much is creating fear, uh, how much is just noise in those spaces. And that's a piece of work that needs some extra work in its own right, I think, some more research. Overall, I would avoid try and encourage everybody involved to avoid knee-jerk reactions. And so correlations don't equal causations, and this graph captures that beautifully. Yeah, you know, just because two things are co-occurring in time or co-occurring in space doesn't mean that one is causing the other. Uh, so more complaints doesn't necessarily mean more problems. Uh, you know, research from the UK has shown what we might call super users to particular crime type um, platforms, web-based platforms, fixmystreet.com. And so if you just relying on the extent to which you're told about things, you might miss these patterns, which could get back to some special interest groups. They have particular agendas that they're trying to push, or it, it could tap into other types of biases, racism, whatever might be apparent in the community that you're working with. I would encourage all of the LGAs who are interested in shaping dialogue in this space to rely on the social science approach. So there's lots of free information and these are all links and I'll make some slides available if that would be useful, but this builds on what we know works to prevent crime and deal with local problems. There's a process you can go through. These are easy to use guides, um, things that you can implement in your own uh, areas. And the idea is rely on a, a process of clearly identifying what it is you're trying to fix, um, implement a strategy that connects to the thing you're trying to fix in a way that will try and make it better and then spend some time to check whether what you did worked or not. Uh, that's really all these things are, are trying to encourage you to do. And these are some ways that you can try and go about it. Um, I would also encourage you to use, engage with the existing technology uh, to try and do things around conducting regular representative local community safety audits to try and get a sense of what's driving people's uh, concerns. Develop locally specific problem focused solutions. So based on evidence, what we know works. Uh, build on all the things I've told you about the non-randomness of victimization, where things happen, who's involved, uh, so that you can implement very targeted responses. Work with, in partnership with other agencies as much as you can. Key agencies that also have an interest in fixing the thing you're trying to address. Build on best practices fund things properly in the sense of giving them enough resources and enough time to see whether or not the change you made actually works and evaluate it critically to see if you got the outcome that you did. And adopt more like a health approach to problem solving where you learn from your failures and you build on your successes. You don't just chuck things out if they didn't work the first time. Right? You have to try and try again. This is a link to uh, a free, um, locally relevant way of gathering data about particular crime and safety problems in real times so that would be worth, I would advise you to have a look at. Um, I would encourage you to report crime and disorder from official sources and you can engage in this on uh, social media as well. Do it in a way that's accurate, so use things like crime rates rather than whole numbers, avoid these year on year comparisons, month, you know, same month last year comparisons, and do this in a consistent and timely manner so that you're building information that's true and reliable into the local public debate. Um, and I would also encourage you to counter misinformation wherever possible. So try and ensure uh, crime and safety information is broadcast on social media that is correct to begin with. It's not easy, especially in environments where it's fast paced. You don't have uh, control necessarily of some of these private groups. Misinformation can uh, spread very quickly. But four, 
ways you can at least think about trying to go about this that are based on cognitive psychology approaches, provide factual alternatives to inaccurate information, try to minimise the extent to which misinformation is repeated when you're countering it. So focus on communicating facts, uh, explicitly clarify why the misinformation is incorrect and why the facts are true and present your correct information in a trustworthy, transparent, plausible manner try and maximise trust and credibility from the people who are interested in what's going on in that space. And so to sum it all up, um, we know crime is going down, has been for a long time, but that doesn't mean there aren't repeat offenders, repeat victims, high crime areas, and some things that police measure have been increasing probably for specific reasons. The media on the whole don't report crime as if it's non-random, as if it's declining and as if it's preventable. Uh, they're influencing fear of crime. We know that social media is an emerging area. Uh, it's still unclear the extent to which it's influencing perceptions of crime and fear of crime. Uh, we don't know how much of what's generated on there is real, how much is false on these people on these special interests, locally run groups. Um, but there definitely does seem to be some indication that they're shaping people's perceptions in a way that might be negative uh, and consistent with the general increase in fear that they get from more sensationalist type news stories. And, to try and counter that, I would encourage interested LGAs to adopt a strategy that's based on evidence, it's consistent, uh, have transparent messaging and engage in evaluation uh, to try and uh, work with these special interest local groups, transmit accurate information in a timely manner, be systematic, address real local issues and minimise concern and the extent to which this information is engaging and increasing this sense of fake news. Uh, and that's it. I mean, we've got some time left for some questions. That was great. Thank you, Joe. Um, can I please get you just to pop the presentation presentation back to me? Yeah. Um, we just have a couple of comments. Sorry, um. uh, am Sorry, I everyone, back to you now? I'll just, yes, yeah, that's great. Thank you. Sorry, just be one second. Okay, so one of the questions that I have here, sorry, just reading. Um, is there a relationship between perceived crime rates and imprisonment rates? both increasing, but maybe association rather than evidence of cause and effect? And that question's from Rosalie. Okay, uh, I'll try to answer that as best I can. The short answer is there's a, research shows there's a very slight uh, relationship between increasing the prison population and getting reductions in crime. Um, but from a cost benefit perspective, it's not an effective way to go forwards. You know, the short answer, Don Weatherburn is the director of the Bureau of Crime Stats and Research in New South Wales. And um, he has given some interviews over the last few years, basically saying that we get the prison population that we want based on the, pop the, um, like the policies that we have, the decisions we make around what we criminalise, what we decide people should go to prison for and how long we send them there for. And there isn't really a strong connect between um, crime prevention and sending people to prison as far as I'm concerned. And in lots of senses, um, prison increases the likelihood of people reoffending later on. Does that answer the question? I think so. I'll, say, I'll just give Rosalie a moment to see if she wants to write um, anything back. But there was also another question around if there's any data um, to do with more modern, uh, um, perhaps what people might feel is a more modern crime, such as credit card theft and fraud or being scammed or conned, like you hear a lot in the media with the elderly? Yeah. Um, traditional sources of data don't collect a lot of that, those emerging crimes very well. Um, the tap and go credit card stuff has definitely been absorbed into police statistics um, in their thefts and particularly the a lot of the sort of theft under $100 type uh, data, which there is trends showing that that is increasing. And the previous police commissioner had even called to banks to 
try and stop people being able to use tap and go as a like pay way of fraud because that's definitely driving up crime uh, as far as that's concerned. But there is no appetite to change that opportunity uh, from the bank's perspective. I think they're not interested in that. There are special studies that are available and it's an emerging area of research priority for the Australian Institute of Criminology to look at um, like cyber crime. And so more special interest data would be available on their websites around those types of things, but they're not routinely collected uh, in the traditional sources in a way that you can pull them apart. Hmm, interesting. Yeah, okay. Um, and at the moment, that seems to be all the questions, but there was quite a few comments that um, the repeat victimisation was quite um, an interesting theme and also the non-random victimisation as well. Um, and there, obviously, the you mentioned the increase in sexual assault and family and domestic violence, but perhaps that was just around the discussion broadening in the community around those topics rather than the incidences increasing. So, yeah. Would you say that's correct around the sexual assault and family and domestic violence? It is more reported perhaps than previous years? Yes, I think that's exactly what's driving. I think it's uh, definitely being reported more and um, the police data that they make public, they even separate um, domestic, sorry, the sexual assaults. I think they separate them from historical ones to current ones. And you can see if you look back over the last few years that there was a large increase in the extent to which people were reporting historical events which I think is consistent with that change in the dialogue and, and change in a belief that the justice system will take it seriously. Yeah, yeah. yeah. As a community, we're kind of looking at it differently. Absolutely, yeah. And if the change is positive, right? So you could argue that maybe that's an example where increased crime, as far as police recorded crime is concerned, is actually a good news story. Yeah, definitely, yeah. Great. Well, thank you so much for your time today, Joe. Um, I really appreciate that. So your um, your presentation was really informative, and we really appreciate you giving us your time to share your knowledge with us all. So thank you.